So in this video, we're going to look at the factory system and how factories developed and, and what was really necessary for the success of these factories. And so the first thing we notice is that you need money. If you're going to build a factory, you need money. And let's remember that the Industrial Revolution takes us from a cottage system a, where people are making things in homes and transitions to factory system where people where things are being made in the factory. Uh, that doesn't happen immediately with every step of the process. More and more steps are moved from the home to the factory over the course of time as inventions are created and as ideas generate um, better, um, more efficient ways of, build, of making the different parts of the, the cloth and the textiles. Uh, and that's one of the things to recognize. Textiles is one of the first things to really be a part of the factory system. So uh, the first thing we see here on this page is money. And so you've got to have money to build factories uh, or capital. And that is generally you just have the money or you raise the money by pooling the resources of many people together to start this factory. Uh, and so you may have a group of investors that will invest in your company, usually friends, people that you know that will trust you. Um, along with that, you've got to have a stable system of laws. People aren't going to be willing to invest if you don't have a stable system of government and laws where they can expect that the rules and and the exp and what's going what's the rules now will be the rules next year and the year after that when the rules change when laws change and they dramatically impact businesses that creates uncertainty and people don't want to invest a lot of money in uncertain times um, what goes along with this is the idea of free enterprise. So you you have free enterprise in the United States, for, and what this means is simply buying and selling with limited government restrictions. So you don't have lots of rules and laws and regulations that say, before you can start your business, you have to do this, 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 and this. Um, of course, today we have a lot more rules and regulations uh, than we had pre-industrial revolution. And so uh, it's more difficult today to start a business than it was in the 1800s in a lot of ways because of the rules and regulations. Uh, but at the same time, some of those rules and regulations we'll often see are there to protect society as, as a whole. So there's a balance that we've talked about already uh, of trade-offs between um, rules and regulations and innovation and creativity that continues. So next, so we've talked about money. The next big things are, resor are resources and ideas. So you're, you can't really have, um, you're not going to have um, a factory. You're not going to develop these things until you have the resources available for these factories. So one of those big resources at first is water, a waterway, because most of our, our factories were powered actually by uh, water power and not by uh, coal and steam engines at first. Um, and over time, then we shift to steam engines. But that shift to steam engine is not really gonna be possible until we have really good access to coal. And in the video you watched the other day, you may have, you may remember that there was a lot of abundant coal in uh, Great Britain, which is one of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution takes place there first. Um, there's a, a significant amount of coal in the United States as well. And so once that, is, that, that information travels to the United States about uh, steam engines, there's that availability of coal in the United States as well. And so we've got, you've got to have money, people that are involved, you've got to have power, whether it's water power with rivers or coal power for the steam engines that will run the factories later. And then you've got to have the ideas and you've got to have, for example, Watt steam engine, which is used, the original use of Watt steam engine is to actually pump water out of coal mines. So they could pump the water out to get more, to get to the coal more easily and to use the coal. Additionally, uh, ideas that come about are steamboats, railroads, and ultimately coal is going to, uh, will be used to power factories as well. So then we have our group of factory men. But actually, let me go back real quickly. Uh, we didn't talk about, so what you see right here, this is an example of the steam engine. So on this side, you have, on this side over here, you have um, the heat source that, and water that would be boiling that would produce steam. That steam goes through a pipe in this direction and it goes both ways. It, it doesn't know which direction to go. It just knows which direction there isn't any pressure. And so it goes and it fills this side up of the pump 
and that moves this piston. And then as it fills this side up, that moves the piston up. And you can see that there's a valve at the top and at the bottom. So the valve at the top right now is releasing this spent steam. And there here at the bottom, it's filling over here. It's filling with unspent steam. And so it reverses back and forth. That piston moves up and down, which moves this wheel. And this power wheel can then be used to power other um, machinery in your factory. Finally, so let's get back to the factory men. So Samuel Slater, he's one of these uh, men. He actually um, works in a British factory. And the thing about Samuel Slater is that he steals his design, this idea from a design for the machinery from British factories. It was against the law to take the plans from the factory out of the factory and anywhere else because Great Britain wanted to keep those plans, keep that secret so that they would keep a monopoly on the, the production of these textiles. Well, Samuel Slater didn't like to steal the, the papers and, and put them in his pocket and then get on a boat to America. No, he memorizes those, those plans. He memorizes how to build it and what goes into it and how it works and then comes here and builds it himself. That is still stealing it. Uh, many people think, well, he didn't actually take anything. He's just smart enough to remember those things. Well, yes, but he didn't have, he, he was breaking the law by doing that. So he stole those designs. There wasn't much that Britain could do about it. And uh, so he comes here and he, he, you know, starts setting up factories here in the United States. Uh, Francis Cabot Lowell really is one of the uh, first people that really gets this going in the United States. Um, and he uh, gets the money together and he does it in, some, in an innovative way in that he sells shares to his business, um, shares for $1,000 so people can own a part or a share of the business by giving him $1,000. He generates that money to build the, make the business and now these people are part owners. He also has some other partners, uh, relatives, family members that help him to do this, but he then ultimately offers these shares to people as well where he can really develop this factory system. And one of the last thing that we haven't really talked about that is necessary for, necessary for these factories is the labor. Uh, and the, these Im this image that you've seen here is uh, representative of the different labor and the different pieces of it. So we've got Samuel Slater here who had the ideas. We've got Francis Cabot Lowell who got gathered the money. We have over here a, a picture of um, of Eli Whitney, who, uh, you know, is one of the inventors, also has ideas. He comes up with um, interchangeable, he really encourages interchangeable parts in the United States. He already, we already talked about him inventing the cotton gin. Uh, then we've got the machinery that these men, some of these men create. And we've got me representing this with this angry face in the background, representing the British that are upset that Samuel Slater stole these ideas. Uh, and then finally, kind of central to all of this is the labor, is the women that do the labor in these textile mills. It was primarily women that worked in these mills at first. Um, and in some cases, uh, they were happy to be able to do this work because it provided them opportunities that they didn't have, uh, provided them some independence, provided them some money to do the, uh, to do things that they perhaps couldn't do in the past. At the same time, the conditions in these factories are, are pretty bad, and we'll watch some other videos on that to kind of understand that a little better. Um, but this is the beginning, really, of uh, many, in many cases, of women working um, outside of the home. Many of the jobs that were done as a family, that it, within a family unit, both husband and wife and the children all staying there on the farm. Well, this is the beginning of, of, of the women going outside of the home and doing some of the work. Generally, the younger women, before they're married, um, or before they are older. Uh, the, this is primarily the work of, you know, probably teenage and early 20s uh, girls and women that are doing this work. All right, so just remember, get to, for these factories, for this factory system to work, you need money, you need the resources and the power. Those go hand in hand, whether it's a water source or power source of coal. Uh, you need the ideas, you need to be able to know how to make the machinery, and then finally you need the labor. And most of that labor, especially at first, was done by women uh, and uh, children as well. So that is the factory system and the of uh, the Industrial Revolution.